It is December 1914 and a squadron of German cruisers are heading east. This is the East Asian Squadron under the command of the aristocratic Vice Admiral Maximilian von Spey. It is a well-drilled fighting force of two armoured cruisers and three light cruisers and it is fresh from a naval victory against the British. But the task von Spey now faces is a difficult one. He must take his squadron home. But this means passing around the southern tip of South America, steaming north across the South and then the North Atlantic, and then somehow passing into the North Sea and reaching a German port whilst evading the Royal Navy. For this is the First World War, the Great War, with the German and Austro-Hungarian empires on one side and the French Republic and the Russian and British empires on the other. Von Spey has already defeated the British 4th Cruiser Squadron under Rear Admiral Sir Christopher Craddock, sinking the armoured cruisers HMS Good Hope and HMS Monmouth, and with another German cruiser, SMS Emden, a veteran of the East Asian Squadron, having played merry havoc against Allied targets in the Indian Ocean, the British are keen to destroy this Teutonic thorn in the Triple Entente side. The Royal Navy's reputation and prestige have been damaged, and the First Lord of the Admiralty, Mr Winston Churchill, and the newly appointed First Sea Lord, Admiral John Jackie Fisher, are determined to destroy the German squadron. During his first tenure as First Sea Lord, Jackie Fisher advocated for battle cruisers. This innovation combines the speed of the cruiser with the heavy firepower of the dreadnought battleship, and it is to the battle cruiser Churchill and Fisher have turned. HMS Invincible and HMS Inflexible are battle cruisers, sister ships built in 1908 and carrying eight 12 inch guns in four turrets. The two British battle cruisers are bigger, faster, and more heavily armed than anything Admiral von Spey has. But in early November of 1914, they are in the Cromarty Firth, in Scotland, whilst the German squadron is nearly half a world away in the southwestern Pacific. Nevertheless, both battlecruisers are placed under the command of Vice Admiral Sir Frederick Doveton Sturdy, formerly the Chief of Staff at the Admiralty, and a man Jackie Fisher dislikes. Both ships are ordered to put to sea. As the Invincible and the Inflexible hurry south, pausing at Plymouth for hurried repairs, in the South Atlantic there is the remnant of the British 4th Cruiser Squadron, the light cruiser HMS Glasgow and the armed merchant cruiser Otranto. They have been joined at the Falkland Islands by the lumbering pre-dreadnought battleship HMS Canopus. Whilst too slow to accompany Admiral Craddock's force as far as Coronel, the Canopus still sports four 12-inch guns, and with a broadside of 4,000 pounds, it is a powerful means of discouraging engagement. Captain Heathcote S. Grant is ordered to deliberately run his ship aground, so the Canopus can act as a stationary gun platform and guard Port Stanley. HMS Glasgow, under Captain John Luce, and the Otranto, under Captain Ernest W. Davidson, are ordered north to join a squadron on the river plate Uruguay, made up of the armoured cruisers HMS Defence, HMS Cornwall, 
and HMS Carnarvon, as well as the armed merchant cruiser Macedonia, all under the flag of Rear Admiral A.C. Stoddart. Another cruiser, HMS Kent, is ordered to join Stoddart's force from Sierra Leone. Stoddart's ships do not remain off Montevideo for long, but put to sea, whilst the Otranto is put on patrol duties off the coast of Brazil. It takes the Invincible and the Inflexible 21 days to reach the Abrolhos rocks off the coast of Brazil, a good 2,300 miles short of the Falkland Islands. The Abrolhos rocks are where Sturdy's battlecruisers meet Stoddart's squadron, and it is here that the nine colliers brought to the rendezvous by Stoddart begin the long, back-breaking work of coaling the British warships. It is in the supply of coal that the Royal Navy is at a disadvantage in the South Atlantic. The Germans have many sympathisers and supporters in coaling harbours along the coast of South America, but the British have only one coaling harbour, Port Stanley in the Falkland Islands, and Maximilian von Spey knows this. Since his defeat of the British 4th Cruiser Squadron off Coronel, von Spey has taken his time. He and his men have been celebrated in Valparaiso, have received the sad news of the defeat of the Emden at Mass Avura, and been awarded iron crosses at San Quentin Bay. He is short on coal and ammunition, and he knows the British will not let Coronel pass without a response. Intelligence has warned him of the cruisers of Montevideo, and he is aware of the presence of a pre-dreadnought battleship. He is unaware of the Invincible and the Inflexible. His squadron flagship is the 12,700-ton armoured cruiser SMS Scharnhurst. She is accompanied by her sister ship, SMS Nisenol, and both carry eight 8.2-inch guns. Their gun crews are counted as excellent shots in a navy of superior gunnery. Indeed, throughout the First World War, the German Imperial Navy will excel in both gunnery and armour. In company with the Scharnhorst and the Neisenau are three light cruisers. SMS Nuremberg of 4,000 tonnes, SMS Dresden of 4,200 tonnes, and the 3,700 ton SMS Leipzig, with its distinctive ram bow. All three carry 10 4.1 inch guns, and can fire broadsides of about 192 pounds. Whilst the German squadron are en route towards Cape Horn, Vice Admiral Sturdy is coaling his ships. He has announced they will leave for the Falkland Islands on the 29th of November. Captain Luce of HMS Glasgow, however, thinks this is too late and strongly urges Sturdy to depart as soon as possible. Sturdy is resistant. But damn it, Luce, we're sailing the day after tomorrow. Isn't that good enough for you? However, after some persistence, Luce gets his way. This, as history shows, proves to be the most crucial British decision of the Battle of the Falklands. The Invincible and the Inflexible leave next morning. With them are the armoured cruisers HMS Kent, HMS Cornwall and HMS Carnarvon, and the light cruisers HMS Bristol and HMS Glasgow, as well as the armed merchant cruiser Macedonia. HMS Defence is sent to Cape Town and plays no more part in this particular story. Along the way, they run gunnery drills, and the results leave a great deal to be desired. The Invincible even manages to entangle one of her screws in a towing cable. They arrive at the Falkland Islands on the 7th of December, and the two light cruisers anchor in Port Stanley Harbour 
whilst the larger ships moor in the outer harbour of Port William. Protected by the 12-inch guns of the beached HMS Canopus and the patrolling Macedonia, with the Kent maintaining its steam ready to relieve the armed merchant cruiser in the morning, the crews of Sturdy's force go to work coaling and making repairs. Sturdy wants his ships ready to put to sea in 48 hours, and he grants some five hours worth of shore leave. After all, there's no desperate hurry, is there? By the 1st of December, Von Spey's coal problem has been solved, and his squadron is at Picton Island, Cape Horn, taking coal out of the hold of a captured British collier loaded with 2,800 tonnes of quality South Wales steaming coal. The Germans seem to be in no hurry, even taking time to duck hunt. It is around this time that von Spey decides to attack the thought-to-be-undefended Port Stanley, so to destroy both the wireless station and any stocks of coal, and perhaps capture the governor. Captain Karl von Schoenberg of SMS Nuremberg likes the idea, as does von Spey's chief of staff. But no one else does. The priority ought to be returning home. Yet von Spey decides the attack will go ahead, and his squadron puts to sea. They enter the South Atlantic, and on the morning of the 8th of December, he has the Nisenol and the Nuremberg approach Port Stanley, whilst the rest of his squadron stay hull down on the horizon, and his three colliers wait close to Port Pleasant. Captain Gustav Merker of the Nisenol sees smoke, sees the distinctive tripod masts of British dreadnoughts and is then unpleasantly surprised by the 12-inch guns of the hidden HMS Canopus. It is 9.20 a.m. and the first shots of the Battle of the Falklands have been fired. 